Chapter Two, Part Two of the Brotherhood of the Seven Kings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Brotherhood of the Seven Kings by L. T. Meade and Robert Eustace. Chapter Two: The Winged Assassin, Part Two. I arrived at Sir John Winton's house about ten o'clock. He was astonished to see me, and when I begged his permission to share the company of the groom in the training stables that night, he seemed inclined to resent my intrusion. I did not wish to betray Alison, but I repeated my request with great firmness. I have a grave reason for making it, I said, but one which at the present moment is best for me not to disclose. Much depends on this race. From the events which have recently transpired, there is little doubt that Calthorpe has a secret enemy. Forewarned is forearmed. Will you share my watch to-night in the training stables, Sir John? Certainly, he answered. I do not see that you have any cause for alarm, but under the circumstances, and in the face of the mad way that nephew of mine has plunged, I cannot but accede to your request. We will go together. We started to walk across the downs. As we did so, Sir John became somewhat garrulous. I thought Alison would have come by your train, he said but have just had a telegram asking me not to expect her. She is probably spending the night with Madame Colucci. By the way, Head, what a charming woman that is. Do you know her? I asked. She was down here on Sunday. Alison begged me to invite her. We all enjoyed her company immensely. She has a wonderful knowledge of horses. In fact, she seems to know all about everything. Has she seen Ajax? I asked. My heart sank. I could not tell why. Yes, I took her to the stables. She was interested in all the horses, and above all in Ajax. She is certain he will win the derby. I said nothing further. We arrived at the stables. Sir John and I spent a wakeful night. Early in the morning I asked to be allowed to examine the colt. He appeared in excellent condition, and the groom stood by him, admiring him, praising his points, and speaking about the certain result of the day's race. "'Here is the derby winner.' he said, clapping Ajax on his glossy side. He'll win the race by a good three lengths. By the way, I hope he won't be off his feed this morning. Off his feed? exclaimed Sir John. What do you mean? What I say, sir. We couldn't get the colt to touch his food last night, although we tempted him with all kinds of things. There ain't nothing in it, I know, and he seems all right now, don't he? Try him with a carrot, said Sir John. The man brought a carrot and offered it to the creature. He turned away from it, and fixed his large, bright eyes on Sir John's face. I fancied there was suffering in them. Sir John seemed to share my fears. He went up to the horse and examined it critically, feeling its nose and ears. "'Tell Saunders to step across,' he said, turning to the groom. He mentioned a veterinary surgeon who lived close by. "'And look you here, Dan. Keep your own counsel. If so much as a word of this gets out, you may do untold mischief.' "'No fear of me, sir.' said the man. He rushed off to fetch Saunders, who soon appeared. The veterinary surgeon was a thickly built man with an intelligent face. He examined the horse carefully, taking his temperature, feeling him all over, and finally stepping back with a satisfied smile. "'There's nothing to be alarmed about, Sir John,' he said. "'The colt is in perfect health. Let him have a mash presently with some crushed corn in it. I'll look in in a couple of hours, but there's nothing wrong. He's as fit as possible.' As the man left the stables, Sir John uttered a profound yawn. "'I confess I had a moment's fright,' he said. "'But I believe it was more from your manner than anything else, Mr. Head. Well, I am sleepy. Won't you come back to the house and let me offer you a shakedown?' "'No,' I replied. "'I want to return to town. I can catch an early train if I start at once.' He shook hands with me, and I went to the railway station. The oppression and apprehension at my heart got worse moment by moment. For what object had Madame Colucci visited the stables? What was the meaning of that mysterious writing which I had in my pocket, innocuous to man, but fatal to the horse? What did the woman with her devilish ingenuity mean to do? Something bad. I had not the slightest doubt. I called at Dufrayer's flat and gave him an account of the night's proceedings. "'I don't like the aspect of affairs, but God grant my fears are groundless,' I cried. The horse is off his feed, but Sir John and the vet are both assured there is nothing whatever the matter with him. 
Madame Colucci was at the stables on Sunday, but after all, what could she do? We must keep the thing dark from Calthorpe, and trust for the best. At a quarter to twelve that day I found myself at Victoria. When I arrived on the platform I saw Calthorpe and Miss Carr coming to meet me. Dufrayer also, a moment afterwards, made his appearance. Miss Carr's eyes were full of question, and I avoided her as much as possible. Calthorpe, on the contrary, seemed to have recovered a good bit of nerve, and to be in a sanguine mood. We took our seats, and the train started for Epsom. As we alighted at the down station, a man in livery hurried up to Calthorpe. "'Sir John is in the paddock, sir,' he said, touching his hat. "'He sent me to you, and says he wishes to see you at once, sir, and also Mr. Head.' The man spoke breathlessly, and seemed very much excited. "'Very well. Tell him we'll both come,' replied Calthorpe. He turned to Dufrayer. "'Will you take charge of Allison?' he said. Calthorpe and I moved off at once. "'What can be the matter?' cried the young man. "'Nothing wrong, I hope. What is that?' he cried the next instant. The enormous crowd was increasing moment by moment, and the din that rose from Tattersall's ring seemed to me unusually loud so early in the day's proceedings. As Calthorpe uttered the last words, he started, and his face turned white. "'Good God! Did you hear that?' he cried, dashing forward. I followed him quickly. The ring was buzzing like an infuriated beehive, and the men in it were hurrying to and fro, as if possessed by the very madness of excitement. It was an absolute pandemonium. The stentorian tones of a brass-voiced bookmaker close beside us fell upon my ears. "'Here, I'll bet five to one Ajax, five to one Ajax!' The voice was suddenly drowned in the deafening clamour of the crowd. The air seemed to swell with the uproar, were my worst fears confirmed? I felt stunned and sick. I turned round. Calthorpe had vanished. Several smart drags were drawn up beside the railings. I glanced up at the occupants of the one beside me. From the box seat, looking down at me, with the amused smile of a spectator, sat Madame Colucci. As I caught her eyes, I thought I detected a flash of triumph. But the next moment she smiled and bowed gracefully. "'You are a true Englishman, Mr. Head,' she said. Even your infatuated devotion to your scientific pursuits cannot restrain you from attending your characteristic national fete. Can you tell me what has happened? Those men seem to have suddenly gone mad. Is that a part of the program? Innocuous to man, but fatal to the horse, was my strange reply. I looked her full in the face. The long lashes covered her brilliant eyes for one flashing moment. Then she smiled at me more serenely than ever. "'I will guess your enigma when the derby is won,' she said. I raised my hat and hurried away. I had seen enough. Suspicion was changed into certainty. The next moment I reached the paddock. I saw Calthorpe engaged in earnest conversation with his uncle. "'It's all up, Head,' he said when he saw me. "'Don't be an idiot, Frank,' cried Sir John Winton angrily. "'I tell you the thing is impossible. I don't believe there is anything the matter with the horse.' Let the ring play their own game. It is nothing to us. Damn the market! I tell you what it is, Frank. When you plunged as you did, you would deserve it if the horse fell dead on the course. But he won't. He'll win by three lengths. There's not another horse in the race. Calthorpe muttered some inaudible reply and turned away. I accompanied him. What is the matter? I asked as we left the paddock. Saunders is not satisfied with the state of the horse. His temperature has gone up, but there— my uncle will see nothing wrong. Well, it will be over soon. For God's sake, don't let us say anything to Allison. Not a word, I replied. We reached the grandstand. Allison's earnest and apprehensive eyes travelled from her lover's face to mine. Calthorpe went up to her and endeavoured to speak cheerfully. I believe it's all right, he said. Sir John says so, and he ought to know. It will be all decided one way or another soon. Look, the first race is starting." We watched it, and the one that followed, hardly caring to know the name of the winner. The derby was timed for three o'clock. It only wanted three minutes to the hour. The ring below was seething with excitement. Calthorpe was silent, now gazing over the course with the vacant expression of a man in a daydream. Bright Star was a hot favorite at even money. "'Against Ajax, five to one!' rang out a monotonous insistence. There was a sudden lull. The flag had fallen." The moments that followed seemed like years of pain. There was much senseless cheering and shouting, a flash of bright colors, and the race was over. Bright Star had won. 
Ajax had been pulled up at Tattenham Corner and was being led by his jockey. Twenty minutes later, Dufrayer and I were in the horse's stable. "'Will you allow me to examine the horse for a moment?' I asked to the veterinary surgeon. "'It will want some experience to make out what is the matter,' replied Saunders. "'It's beyond me.' I entered the box and examined the colt carefully. As I did so, the meaning of Madame Colucci's words became plain. Too late now to do anything. The race was lost, and the horse was doomed. I looked around me. "'Has any one been bitten in this stable?' I asked. "'Bitten?' cried one of the grooms. "'Why, I say to Sam last night,' he apostrophized the stable-boy, "'that there must be gnats about. See my arm, it's all inflamed.' "'Hold!' I cried. "'What is that on your sleeve?' "'A housefly, I suppose, sir,' he answered. "'Stand still!' I cried. I put out my hand and captured the fly. "'Give me a glass,' I said. "'I must examine this.' One was brought, and the fly put under it. I looked at it carefully. It resembled the ordinary housefly, except the wings were longer. Its color was like an ordinary humming-bee. "'I killed a fly like that this morning,' said Sam, the stable-boy, pushing his head forward. "'When did you say you were first bitten?' I asked, turning to the groom. "'A day or two ago,' he replied. "'I was bitten by a gnat. I don't rightly know the time. Sam, you was bitten, too. We couldn't catch it, and we wondered that gnats should be about so early in the year. It has nothing to do with the horse, has it, sir?' I motioned to the veterinary surgeon to come forward, and once more we examined Ajax. He now showed serious and unmistakable signs of malaise. "'Can you make anything out?' asked Saunders. "'With this fly before me there is little doubt,' I replied. "'The horse will be dead in ten days. Nothing can save him. He has been bitten by the tsetse fly of South Africa. I know it only too well.' My news fell on the bystanders like a thunderbolt. "'Innocuous to man, but fatal to the horse,' I found myself repeating. The knowledge of this fact had been taken advantage of. The devilish ingenuity of the plot was revealed. In all probability, Madame Colucci herself had let the winged assassin loose when she had entered the stables on Sunday. The plot was worthy of her brain and hers alone. "'You had better look after the other horses,' I said, turning to the grooms. "'If they have not been bitten already, they had better be removed from the stables immediately.' As for Ajax, he is doomed. Late that evening, Dufrayer dined with me alone. Pity for Calthorpe was only exceeded by our indignation and almost fear of Madame Colucci. "'What is to happen?' asked Dufrayer. "'Calthorpe is a brave man and will recover,' I said. "'He will win Miss Carr yet. I am rich, and I mean to help him, if for no other reason than in order to defeat that woman.' "'By the way,' said Dufrayer, that scrap of paper which you hold in your possession, coupled with the fact that Mr. Carr called upon Madame Colucci, might induce a magistrate to commit them both for conspiracy. I doubt it, I replied. The risk is not worth running. If we failed, the woman would leave the country, to return again in more dangerous guise. No, Dufrayer, we must bide our time, until we get such a case against her as will secure conviction without the least doubt. At least— cried Dufrayer. What happened to-day has shown me the truth of your words. It has also brought me to a decision. For the future I shall work with you, not as your employed legal adviser, but hand in hand against the horrible power and machinations of that woman. We will meet wit with wit until we bring her to the justice she deserves. End of chapter 2